Asalaamu As Alaikum all and thank you for joining me for another episode of the Revival, Reflection and Ramadan webinar series. This is a series brought to you by the Ramadan 10 Project and the purpose of these webinars is to help us best prepare for the upcoming month of Ramadan uh, so that not only can we make the month of make the most of the blessed month but also continue our good seeds and habits after the month of Ramadan. And before we go on to talking about today's topics, I just want to first of all take the opportunity to thank you all for joining in us in our previous webinars. Um, thank you for your engagements with us and with our previous guests, uh, whether that be via Zoom or via our social media channels. I also want to say a big thank you to you all for those of you who have signed up to our My Oath Niftar packs and are helping us uh, during these unprecedented times to keep the Ramadan spirit alive. Um, for those of you who have signed up for a physical pack, you should have uh, received one by now. If not, there'll be one arriving on your doorsteps in the next week. For those of you who haven't signed up to a physical pack, um, not to worry, you can still sign up for an e-pack and that can be sent to you directly. With that being said, we are in unprecedented times and there is a bigger need now more than ever for individuals to empower themselves and their communities to come closer together. And this will be the key theme of today's webinar. We will, be, we will be discussing the community capacity and how we can create impactful change. Um, before I bring in, introduce our, um, before I go on to the questions, sorry, I just want to introduce our guest speaker today. Um, it gives me great privilege, privilege and an honor to introduce Dr. Hani Elbana, who is the president of the Humanitarian Forum, Forum and the co-founder of Islamic Relief. Since leaving Islamic Relief in 2008, Dr. In 2008, Dr. Hani has founded the Muslim Charities Forum and the Humanitarian Forum. Both organizations seek to foster partnerships and closer cooperation among the humanitarian and charitable organizations from Muslim countries and their Western counterparts. He is also the chairman of Zakat House, a social enterprise helping new and growing charities. Dr. Hani, how are you doing? Are you well? Oh, fine, thank you. Thank you. How is uh, London? London is fine for me. I mean, alhamdulillah, I'm quite fortunate where, um, you know, I'm, I'm safe, I'm well, I have my health. Uh, you know, it's, a, like I said, unprecedented times. Um, I've never seen London so quiet. Um, I'm also fortunate where I'm still working and every now and again I do have to go to the office. And a few times I've had to have a stroll through Hyde Park at six o'clock in the morning. And it's a very eerie place. It's, uh, it's not how it used to be, how it was three or four months ago. How are you? How's life in Birmingham? Well, quiet, very quiet. Roads are clear, empty, and uh, so taking risks in at home, no travel, but uh, doing something from home most of the time. That's good to hear. Alhamdulillah, that's good to hear. Um, I want to. Obviously, we are in unprecedented times, and with Ramadan coming, and with this pandemic, um, a lot of People have said that, you know, in our previous webinars that this pandemic, we, we should, A, as Muslims, be used to, you know, isolation and self-control because we fasted previous months and previous years, and that gives us um, self-control. And also a lot of people have previously said that we should use this pandemic to get into the habit of, um, you know, better preparing ourselves for Ramadan and this upcoming month. So you know your forte is working in the charity sectors is social action my question to you is with ramadan coming up and with the current unprecedented situation we're in right now how as individuals and communities can we best put ourselves to use and what action should we take to make sure that all the social action all the social justice all the community work we do has a lasting impact and also more importantly impacts those who need it the most? Uh, do we need to wait for Ramadan to have a special impact on our community? No. As we have been created human beings as custodian for the universe, Allah created us to look after the universe, to construct the universe and make the life in the universe habitable for everyone. So this is our mission, whether we are Muslims or non-Muslims, as human beings, as Allah SWT was explaining to the angels. Actually, our, the role of Adam, and when they started to argue with him uh, about 
the, his role. Even as we know that uh, Satan refused to make sujood to Adam. This actually Adam, alayhi salam, at that time was the icon for humanity and we are all the sons and daughters of Adam, whether we are Muslims or non-Muslims. So we have a role. Nothing to do for, for, for Ramadan. Unfortunately, uh, people uh, uh, accelerate or escalate their role in Ramadan because of the reward. The calculation time, a prayer, sunnah becomes a fard, fard becomes more reward and charity and, and, and. So but what about the 11 months outside Ramadan? Muslims should not behave like this. Most of the greatest conquest of Islam in the good old days were during the month of Ramadan. And people were, were fasting, and people were thirsty, and people were making jihad and giving their life up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the sake of Allah. Why we actually only talk about Ramadan? Ramadan, of course, is the month of blessing, the month of the Quran revealed, the month of forgiveness, and the month of the night of power, and, and all these sort of things. But my message is to my young sisters and brothers and my colleague and my everybody is we should not only be waiting for Ramadan to act and make community action. Actually, in the good old days, Brother Ahmad, during Ramadan, of course, we escalated our action in Ramadan. But before Ramadan, people are dying. The corona virus of the pandemic started maybe in September or October last year and started to be known in December. So why should we wait from December, January, February, March, April, five months to act? Are we going to wait for Ramadan to act? Or is our duty, actually, which Allah has given it to us long time ago, is that you are the custodian of the universe. You don't spoil the universe. You don't pollute the climate. You don't change, uh, you don't uh, do something bad to change the climate and, and all these sorts of things. You bring justice, you bring social cohesion, and you bring this bonding between different sectors of the community, as well as different individuals and culture of the community. And this is actually my role. Try to remind my brothers and sisters, make Ramadan to be every day, every second, every hour, and every month. To be more blessing by Allah in Ramadan, but we should act 24-7 for the whole year. Thank you for that, Dr. Hani. Um, as you've said there, and I mean, I've touched on it as well, that, you know, for us, this webinar series is in the build up to Ramadan. It's how we can get the month of the blessings out of Ramadan. And, you know, as you've rightly, rightly pointed out, that we should act in the 11 months outside of Ramadan the same like we should in during Ramadan. Um, in terms of what you just said there, putting that into practice, if, for example, someone wanted to give zakat or give charity or go out and help a community and be that bridge to sort of bring communities together, regardless of whether it's a pandemic or whether it's Ramadan, how, in your opinion, is it best to do that? From the knowledge you've gained from you know, from your days, from co-founding Islamic Relief to everything, to all the good work you're doing now, what advice would you give to people? Well, people should give every day, every hour, every month. There's no end. There's no special time for giving. That's why I'm a little bit yani, concerned about the people who only wait to give their zakah and sadaqah and Ramadan. Why? Or to give during Muharram. Why? People are dying, See, as I mentioned in one of the interviews. There's, a, there's a, an, an individual dying every second from hunger. People are hungry. More than 800 and maybe 20 something million are, are suffering from hunger. Six million children are dying every year from hunger, being hungry. And 36 million individuals like myself dying every year. So why should I wait for Ramadan? Why should they wait for Muharram? Why should they wait for Ashura? Why? This mentality and the mindset, because I'm going to get more reward. No, people are dying in front of me. The charitable activity is a part and parcel of the life of the Muslim. 
Prophet Sallallahu was described by his wife, Khadija, Bibi Khadija, anha, but he is a social worker. When the Quran was revealed to him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and they came to her, and they, trembling in fear because of the, 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 the incident. And she told them, Allah will never let you down. You know why? Because you are very good to your neighbors. You are very good to your family. You are helping the needy. You are empowering the people. And you are uh, taking the people by hand. Social worker and humanitarian worker and relief worker was the Prophet He was not doing it when he became a prophet. He was not doing it in Ramadan. He was not doing it. He was doing 24 hours for the whole year. So my appeal for all my brothers and sisters, actually, donate whenever you can, wherever you can. Don't only wait for Ramadan. Don't only wait for Ramadan. Don't only wait for Ramadan. Um, okay, thank you for that. Um, with, you just mentioned there, people do wait till Ramadan or Muharram to give Sadaqah or to give zakat or to give charity or to volunteer or even give their time Why is it that people or why is it that we are we have this mentality of you know only donating in, in Ramadan and more importantly How do we get out of that mentality or how do you get the masses to get out of that mentality? Because I'm sure there'll be individuals out there who do work, you know 365 days a year who will volunteer who will give Sadaqah who will be you know be good to their neighbors You know people that will do that 365 years, but well, 365 days per year. But as you've mentioned, a lot of people, you know, work will stay till Ramadan, and as well as you know the individual sort of donating, a lot of you know charities we see today always work till Ramadan, and they'll also try and sort of you know act on that and try and commercialize that aspect. So how do you how do we get people or the masses to be like how they are during Ramadan? all year round, and how do we change that mentality? This is the sentimentalism to Ramadan. As I mentioned earlier on, the man, Ramadan is the month of blessing, the month of forgiveness, the month of mercy, and the month of being, being actually protected from hellfire. Okay? The month of reward. All of this in Ramadan. This has been, and I've got the, the, the uh, Laylatul Qadr, which is the night of power, which is equivalent in as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, 283 years or 1,000 uh, 1, nights, something like that. Is that right? Yeah. Alf shahr, alf shahr. Okay, alf shahr, no, 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 1,000 months, 1,000 months, okay? The, 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 the night of power. So this is one side of the coin, because I want to get the reward, because it's multiplies, the multiplicity factor. If you talk about... Uh, uh, Khawarizmi or whatever, uh, al Jabra, the, the, the multiplication of my reward happened in Ramadan. The multiplication of my reward was happening in the night of power. Okay, because I want to benefit myself as well. People going to Mecca and Medina to pray because, not because they want to be with Allah in the, in, 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 in the, in, in, in the house of Allah in Mecca, but because they are calculating actually. The, the, the reward of the prayer in Mecca, the reward of the prayer in Medina, the reward of the prayer in Jerusalem, in Al Quds. Okay? Not because they want to meet the, to, 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 to visit the Prophet, but to, 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 to suffer and spend all of this for the sake of Allah. Actually, when we look at it from one side, we become one sided in our actually approach to the community. We value our reward more than valuing the benefit of the people who are going to be helped by us. Okay. And this is, this is very serious. Very serious at the, mind, uh, the, uh, the, the, the mindset of the people. 40% of the money of charity come in Ramadan. Why? Why? And the 60% in 11 months. And I give 5% every month to the charity where people dying every day by the second, and I wait for Ramadan for to benefit myself, is wrong. Wrong on the philosophy of thinking, wrong on our theological understanding, wrong on our aqidah, and wrong on our morality as well. I only, no, 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 let us, not only Ramadan, the, tw the, the night of the 27th of Ramadan. How more blessing, more blessing, how do you know? How do you know that actually get all this blessing in Ramadan 
when, when I need it because I'm dying, when I need it because I'm thirsty and hungry and I'm sick, and you give me the money now, could be more multiplication of reward to me than Ramadan, when I'm not sick, when I become dead. What benefit will I have when you give your money in Ramadan and the people are dying in Shawwal and dying in Rajab and dying in Tulqa'da and, 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 and. Young people, this might this my appeal to the young people like you, Brother Ahmad. They have to understand that the one who multiplies the reward is Allah, not me. It's the month. It's, it's not the month. It is Allah is looking at my intention and looking at the need and looking at our drive to, to stretch our hand and to reach the most affected people in, in, in the community or any, anywhere else. Do I have to wait to help the Yemeni who are actually stranded there by, by the war or the Syrians who got millions till Ramadan comes? What kind of mindset we are having nowadays? Women and children are living inside or underneath a broken, uh, destroyed or demolished houses. No blankets, no tents, no food, no water, no medicine. And you tell me, wait till Ramadan to get the money to the Syrian or to get the money to the Rohingya people or to get the money to the Yemeni or to get them everywhere? No, there are people dying every day. Every second, by the second, we need you and me to try to change the mindset of the donors. Donate every day and let the reward to be in the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For this, I'll tell you how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very merciful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgiven a prostitute from the children of Israel, a prostitute, when she saw a panting dog, thirsty and she took her shoes and she went to the well and gave him a drink of water allah forgiven her and she was what she was a prostitute so don't underestimate what allah can do for you at the time when the people need you to pay the, your zakah and charity because they need they need, they need it now not in ramadan we are living in Europe and America and in the West. We should not behave with this culture. Thank you for that. Um, I just want to add to that, um, just because the, one of the previous webinars we did, we had um, a world-renowned Islamic economist, Dr. Mehmet, on the webinar. And one of the things he said was, uh, one of the things he said was that people you were talking about the Islamic economy and we've sort of had a quite a good discussion on that but one of the things he said was that people don't do things for the sake of Allah anymore similar to what you've just said and one thing I always go back to is I was chatting to a friend last Ramadan and he was uh, due to give a khutbah a Jummah and the audience his target audience was the people working in the city so people working in the finance sector and obviously they were talking about you know everyone in that sort of um, sector uses phrases like hedge funding and you know managing portfolios etc and one of the ways he said he would tell people to essentially do what you have just told us or told myself and the views to do is to almost look at your deeds as like your wealth and mm. he said that if you were a hedge fund manager or if you were you know an investor don't just you wouldn't just hedge all of your wealth on one thing and likewise we shouldn't you know hedge you know our what what our fate is in the akira on just that one night whether it be Layla or what one month we should be so we should be doing this daily similar to what you've just said so that you know we are accumulating our you know our deeds throughout the year and not just during Ramadan, but even going back with what I've just said about accumulating, we, should, we shouldn't even be thinking about that. It should be whatever we do, we should be doing for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's the way. So that was just one story I just wanted to share with people in terms of sometimes if you just make it relatable, I think that was just my way of so it's just sharing with um, others of how um, a friend of mine made that relatable to his audience. This is actually been explained in the hadith of the Prophet who said, 
أحب الأعمال إلى الله أدومها وإن قال the most beloved deed for Allah is the continuous even if it's little five pound every day for a year this will give me as a charitable worker as a community worker and social worker the ability to make a budget I know that every month I have ten thousand pound five thousand pound twenty thousand pound so my budget every year is one million or five hundred thousand so I can plan actually to support and finance this and another another uh, uh, and another hadith by the Prophet who said uh, the best of charity is the effort of the one who is in need in secrecy to the one who needs it most see how it is uh, Prophet encouraging even the people who are no income to give anything 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 to the people who need it most and this is what we call it ithar when actually you have something for yourself but you and you deserve it but you decide not to eat to eat eat or drink and give it to your next door neighbor whether this neighbor is a muslim or not and this is where the beauty of islam is brother ahmad quite often in the in, in sadaqah especially there is no difference between giving to Muslim and non-Muslim. I know that zakah, six categories or seven categories are actually for the Muslim. And one of them is for the non-Muslim. But actually in sadaqah, there is no, there is no distinction between Muslim and non-Muslim. Even in, in orphan sponsorship, Allah never said Muslim. In, in, in widows, Allah never said Muslim. And, and miskin and yatim and, and faqir and, and Allah make it so broad, so wide to include everything, every, every, every individual in this site. Thank you for that. Um, again, I think what you've just said there uh, sort of resonates and it's also a reminder for myself as well as all those um, viewing today. Um, with, you know, with, with, we've talked a lot about sort of the intention and the mentality of people given during Ramadan um, and how we, and we've also mentioned that you know we should be doing that year round when it comes to the time of giving whether it be in the month of ramadan when it whether it be outside of the month of ramadan whether it be five pounds whether it be ten pounds what's the best way for an individual a muslim to go and donate that money and, and how should that money be spent is it a case of you know should there be you know, giving it to an online charity so they can then do all the work or should they be doing it something local to their community where they can physically see, you know, where that money getting spent and that money being, you know, used and they can see that or, you know, what's, how's, how's your answer to that question? I think we should give locally, regionally and internationally. Because nowadays on us there's a duty there's a duty on us as Muslims to give to the homeless, to give to the elderly, to, the, to give to even to uh, the climate change in this country as well, and to even, even to the guide dog for the blind people. You see, all these things are part of our society. You can see all those young, young men and women in the middle of the road, everywhere in UK, they need help. They need food, they need everything. Give them, give them. You can divide your uh, money proportionately to, because we need to build local organization here in UK. Charity starts at home, this one thing. Plus there's a greater need, maybe in Pakistan, in India, in Bangladesh, maybe in, in Yogur, maybe in Yemen, maybe in Myanmar, maybe in Palestine, in Gaza, all this, we have to give. For me, I have to divide my cake between the local community and the community outside my country to help them, also to give to my relatives. So, Wallahi, with the good intention of you, no matter how little is your donation is, the reward and the blessing of that money when it reaches individual will be more sufficient than you think. Don't ever underestimate any act of goodness. 
or any amount of money, ربع درهم سبق سبق ألف درهم maybe one درهم or one pound or one pence or five pence or ten pence may be ahead of one thousand pound because of your intention, because of your drive, because of your love to the act of charity and to the poor people. And this is what actually I'm trying to say. Try to look at the needs locally, which they deserve actually to be supported and try to, to, to look at your family members in a, in, a, in, a, in a poor country as well as uh, countries like uh, Syria or Libya, so not Libya, Syria or Yemen or uh, or uh, or, or uh, Gaza or Palestine or, 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 or. And you decide. You decide. Because everybody is in need. Also, inside this, there's money for water, there's money for agriculture, there's money for sponsorship of orphans and widows, there's money for actually building schools, for education, there's money for empowering young people, all this. There's many, many projects now. Many projects. Because the charitable field, alhamdulillah, and a lot of our organization, like uh, in, in this country, I'm not going to be favoring anyone, all of them, I trust all of them, are doing incredible work in different parts of the world for different activities. But we want to move uh, 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 to a higher place because the uh, competition here is very, very, uh, what do you call it, competitive uh, to be competing with actually the international and Muslim organization are actually doing far more better than all our Muslim charities. And I wish that we can actually go maybe to talk about what is the problems are facing the Muslim charities in the country or anywhere else. Yes. Thank you for that. Um, I've got a couple of more questions. Um, just, I mean, personally from me, just obviously listening to what you've been saying and obviously listening to others um, about the charity sector in general. Um, a lot of people, and this is not me personally, because I kind of understand how charities do work, but a lot of people have, you know, are quite reluctant to, if they see like a big international charity, to donate to that international charity because they're always worried that their funds might not go to what is being advertised for. So, for example, if a charity, um, you know, says that, you know, if you donate £50, this could feed a family of four for a month in, you know, whichever part of the world needs it. Um, but then a lot of people will be put off by that because, you know, they're worried that thing money get, uh, that money might get instead spent on admin fees or might get used somewhere else. What message do you have to those people? First of all, there is no food cooked without fire. Okay? And even when you buy your own meal, your, your wife at home is cooking for you. This is admin. Electricity, gas, cleaning, the time of your wife at home. Ask those people to wake up. Wake up, people. There's nothing with no expenses. And my message today, whoever tell you 0% admin, he or she is liars. And this is my statement. Liars. If you have income from different resources to support your admin, declare it. But what I'm telling to the donor, there is no work no charity without admin. And the administration could go from 5% sometimes to 30, 40, and 50%. You tell me why. I tell you how. In an area when you need to have an airdrop, when there's no roads, flooding or destruction, whatever it is, or war, and people are stranded in the middle of no man's land, no truck, no car, no animals, no lorry can, can actually get the aid material to those people. How on earth they are going to send it? By air. It might go rocket high, about 40, 50% or maybe more. And here you have to understand the mechanics and the cost of the operation, the charitable operation in a conflict zone. In a conflict zone. When you have areas in a, in a, in a, in a less Conf uh, no conflict zone where the transportation is good administration goes down but what I'm saying 
Brother Ahmad, and to everybody listening and seeing me now, there's no, no charity without cost. And if you are going to work on an international field, just take it from me as an individual, who alhamdulillah learned from the 70s, or the, you know, from the 80s, in the, from, from scratch. Any international organization, any international organization, any international organization cost on the international field from here, here, here to 20 or 30 or 40 offices, their, their admin costs will not be less than 15%. Okay. And if you call yourself international and you have offices and you have staff and other because you have to send to, to secure your money. Now, with this regulation of the banking industry, with this counter-extremism, counter-terrorism, and, and, and this negative impact on the banking, not only that, tell those people are actually trying to de 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 uh, demean uh, or actually uh, defame the charitable sector. Tell them, we are being surrounded by banks who delays the transfer, the money transfer for months because my name is Hassan or Mahmoud or Ali or Omar, whatever it is, because my name is Islamic organization. We are under this scrutiny when we want to save people, the banking is stopping us. If, if the donor will start to only to be uh, uh, negative or nagging the organization or reluctant, may Allah help him or her. But we are going to work. And we are going to work because we take the charitable activity the material activity as a mission, not as a job, as a mission, as a life mission, mission, and the message to deliver, to educate our youngster how to do proper charitable activity. But to conclude, so, uh, at, at the end, see, there is no charitable delivery with, with no cost. And it Thank goes you. from 5% to 15% or sometimes 20%. And if you're in a very difficult area, go to 40 or 50. And because, you know why, Brother Ahmad, we are doing this because of sake of Allah. We're not doing it because we are, we are trying to please you. We have to be transparent. We have to be transparent. We are living at the, at, at the era of this mass communication. And we're still talking about don't pay admin for this, because this organization so and so. And you have the right as a donor. You have the right as a donor. You have to ask me, to ask the charitable organization. Then when you are satisfied, you pay your money. If you are not satisfied, plenty of organization in the market you can help them. Or even go to help some local organization in different countries. It does not make any difference. But help the organization that you know better than helping the organization that you don't know. Thank you for that advice. Um, with, I mean, I know we've talked about, you know, people again, and I'll repeat that, you know, people do have this tendency to sort of hedge all their zakat or give all their donations during the month of Ramadan and obviously to, you know, to do that to gain their deeds. We are now, I think, you know, I mean, it's, I think it would be naive of us both to say that people aren't going to do that this Ramadan, despite what we've just said. What's your advice to, those especially the youngsters the people who have just come out of university and who are working their first job so for some people that might be given their first time where they could be given a lot more zakat because they're going to be earning what's your advice to that group of people in terms of who to give money to or not necessarily who to give money to but what cause to give money to um you know you touched on that charity begins at home or charity starts at home so would you are you that now you're now saying that you know we should um focus on giving helping our communities locally as well as internationally how would you divide that um you know i'm just these are questions what have been asked to me previously and people are um are, are curious and want to know this so they can i think they're very keen to see that the money they invest in a charity or donate to a charity is used wisely and has the greatest sort of benefit to the end user so first of all for the youngsters who are actually locked in now in the houses and they don't have money. Those youngsters uh, can help and can become a volunteer 
to any charity of their life to help them on the social media. I take the example, actually we have an organization called Muslim Charities Forum, coordinating the work between about 17 or 20 organizations, and now they have a campaign, social media campaign. Most of their workers are volunteers uh, at, the, at the age of 20, 21, 25. And they are doing, well, like they are doing a great job, a great job, talent. So those actually can become volunteers. Those young people at the time of Corona and Ramadan as well, can educate others, can raise the awareness about how to uh, distribute your wealth in Ramadan or outside Ramadan to great, bring great ideas. So I'm not going to say that the one who does not have a job, actually done or recently qualified or have low income, cannot do something while he or she is sitting at home. This is number one. Number two, when we look at how to divide our uh, wealth or our zakat or our sadaqa, actually in Ramadan, our sad Ramadan, actually between the local and the international, the first step is to understand the needs of the people here and the needs of the people there. Then you make stikhara or you make consultation with other people. You might say, because we are living in a country with the social welfare system, I can give 10 to 20% of my zakat and sadaqa in this country which have a good world, uh, social welfare system. But countries like uh, Somalia, like uh, Ethiopia, like Sub-Saharan Africa, like Togo, like some parts of Afghanistan and Pakistan and India and Bangladesh and all those are Palestine, Yemen, Eritrea. Do you remember, do you, do you remember Eritrea? Sorry, say again, who paid this call? Do you remember Eritrea, Eritrea? Yes. You see, nobody talks about it. You know what, Prasad Ahmad, there's about 400,000 people in Sudan as refugees since the 70s. And there is no funding coming to them, living as refugees since the 70s, since the war there. So you have to know where the needs is most and give the vibe between the local here, your family, as well as the internet, Palestinian, Gaza is under siege for the last seven years. You might decide, I'm not going to give money in, in here, in UK or in America or in the West, I'm going to give my money to Gaza, or I'm going to give my money to, Af to Afghanistan, I'm going to give my money to any part of the world. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you the reward according to your intention and the needs of the people. So every blessing will come to you from any small charity you do, just but do it itself. It's clear. That's yeah, that's very clear. Um thank you for this. And I think it's been it's been quite insightful, especially from you know, hearing it from someone who's got so much experience as yourself. Um I've got a few questions and I hope you don't mind me asking. How did, you get in, how did you get involved in this? How did Islamic Relief come about then? I mean, I don't want to start plugging other charities, but how did you, I mean, I appreciate that you, know, you were the co-founder and I just want to sort of, I just want to get your story out there because, I mean, it, it's inspired me and I'm sure it inspired many sort of millions around the world. So how did you come about from, you know, have something starting so small to being essentially the biggest Islamic charity in the Western world? So, Alhamdulillah, uh, we did not have any plan, any strategy, any funding, any big figures like uh, superstar or big businessman. Me and my colleague, Ahsan, Dr. Ahsan, when I was a medical student doing my doctor of medicine, which is equivalent to PhD, and he was doing his doctor of philosophy in chemistry. There was a famine in Africa, in Eritrea and Tigran in 1983. And they found there's no Muslim organization in the country, in the whole West at that time. And I visited Sudan. And I was told or uh, informed about the, the plight of the famine in Eritrea and Tigran at that time. And there's a lot of Muslims and non-Muslims, Muslim, non-Muslims and non-Muslims, majority of non-Muslims. 
We came back with an idea. Let us do something. Let's do something. I, I raised about a few, uh, 1,500 Egyptian pounds from my family in Cairo. The first 20 pence was from a nine-year-old boy, young boy, who, it was a chocolate money. <laughs> then I gave khutbah in Birmingham and Aspen and University, 500 pounds from uh, uh, Then I put all this money in the bank. And we were legging it door to door, street to street, shop to shop, mosque to mosque, everywhere, collecting the pennies and the pounds. Collecting, even, alhamdulillah, I am very proud to say that I could be the first one who hold a donation box, cart, uh, 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 cart, 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 donation box outside the Birmingham Central Mosque in 1986. Because you people are very gentle. You just get the donation box or the donation box between the individuals praying there. But I took it aggressively on the road. And you know, in one hour after a prayer, I raised maybe 1,500 pounds. More than the most uh, raising inside. Because I, I get used to, to do this when I was in Egypt with all the beggars in front of the big mosques in this area. So this is how we started. No office, no desk. No cabinets. Uh -huh. It is the start, the, 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 the start of the no resources. But to have it clear that we want to help. Even we used to sing, I want to help the refugees in Africa. And I was, I was singing it with the children in some of the uh, summer camps. I, we want to help the children in Africa. We want to help the children in Africa. And the children used to go around with me and we, you know the plastic donation boxes, shaking it. We, you can imagine that if you've got 20 or 30 children with 20, 30 donation boxes, and this individual singing with them, and to, to disturb uh, uh, the, the camp, and they have to pay the money to, start, to keep us quiet. This is how we started. This is how we started, actually. It was a time, I, I hope, that, uh, that actually we're doing everything by hand. Even the printing, you have the literacy. No computer, huh? only typewriter, and handwritten messages. And literacy, you keep putting the letter next to another to make, make, to make a poster. The manual mentality made you to be more genius and forward thinking and having the ability to explore the hidden world with no resources. Unfortunately, nowadays, everybody has, what is this, you know? The telephone, the internet, and people are relax. Oh, yeah, yeah, tick, 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 tick. I want him to dream. I want the, the young girls and the young brothers to dream about how they, with their hands, can go and make the change. That's why quite often, every year, or well, not every year, yeah, and every year I visit about 15 or 20 countries, at least, to learn from the people who have no resources, and to learn how to find the solution and to learn how can we bridge between the poverty-stricken local community in Africa and Asia and Latin America and others and the affluent community here. So we started like this, but we we're focusing, Brother Ahmad. If you don't focus, you lose your match, if you if you are a supporter of Manchester United or Liverpool or whatever it is. If, uh, I don't know the, the strikers in, in Manchester United, I used to know uh, Rooney, uh, this is the last I knew, but uh, <laughs> it's good to you, isn't it? Mo Salah or whatever it is, the other people actually, if they don't focus, they will never score. Yeah. That's actually for you, as a young man, you have the mission, you see, when I, when, when I, when I uh, touch my, my, my heart like this, you have the vision at the back of your mind, and you focus to score. Something else we, we did uh, at that time, subhanAllah, when I was uh, traveling after registering, uh, as, uh, the organization was registered in 1989, I used to look at the world map. You know this world map? Yeah. I dream. I dream. Putting circles around cities, towns, countries, in Africa, in Asia, America, Canada, 
and Europe, about these circles. I was seeing the dream, or we were seeing the dream, and alhamdulillah, most of these circles become true. If you want your dream to become true, you are the only one who can change it from a dream to a true reality in life. So between the no office time till now, it was a long process of processing people. You know who made this movement successful? It's young, young people at the, at the secondary school and the university level. Most of the work of this organization in the 80s and 90s was done by the, 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 the secondary school students and the university students. We used to stay in, in the hall till about midnight to get the envelopes, to, uh, to, to fold the leaflet, to put it inside the envelope, and to seal it, the envelopes, either with, with a sponge, then they stick the, the, what they call it, the stamp, then they stick the address, and you know what, at the end of the reward was what? Some chips and half kebab. <laughs> or but the spirit was there. I want you with the technology to bring the spirit back. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that story. Um, just on touching on that, um, with regards to what you said there with uh, secondary school students and university students, why is it that we do see that sort of it's that demographic, age demographic um, working most in the charity sector? Is it due to the fact that they don't have jobs and you know, they might not have a family of their own and you know, they're using their time more sort of efficiently? Or is it due to the fact that just down to enthusiasm and passion or is it a mixture of both? Can you say the question again because I didn't catch it? Um, so the question was, is, you know, you touched on you know, how you said there about secondary school students in the 80s and the 90s, you know, working sort of day and night to obviously help the charity. Why no, no, is no, it? no, no, not working, volunteering. I'm volunteering, I should say, sorry, volunteering. Why is it that it's that demographic which volunteer the most? Is it just down to the fact that they have that enthusiasm? The enth is it down to like the enthusiasm of the youth? Or is it down to the fact that, you know, they don't have their own families and, you know, they're not in jobs, so they have that time to volunteer? Or is no, it no, a, mixture no. of both, a mixture of both? No, 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 no. It is, they want to be identified that they're doing something. You know, when you are living as a minority in a country and uh, you are, could be treated as not first class citizen, those people would like to be relating themselves to a newly born establishment or something to do something. But at the age, at that age, the 15 to 20, then the, 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 the university student as well, they want to help. They have the power, they have the edge, they have the love. Not because their family is poor and other. No, no. Actually, we tested this in two or three occasions because this is identification of the strength of our community. What was the first one? We wanted to attract more youth. We made something called the Islamic Leave Games. We hired NAC, the National Exhibition Center, the largest in the UK. This was a day which was costing the charity 25,000 pounds. 8,000 young people came to play football, uh, I can't remember, table tennis and others, volleyball and others. And the whole day for the family to come out to say that we are going to NAC, NAC, because there was no go area for our community at that time. Okay, so one side were empowering young people to come and play. You know how many football teams have 120 or 140 or 160 football teams to play, plus others, other games. You know, one time, this is a very nice story which happened, true story. We were sometimes making our, our uh, office as, as, a, as a hub for people to sleep overnight. And two or three teams came from Bradford and they were sleeping in one of the rooms. You know, the youngster, two, 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 keep talking, 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 talking. Talk. I went there at 12 o'clock, said, please sleep. Then I went back to o'clock, said, please sleep. Then I switched the light off. You know what I told them? If you don't sleep and you don't pray fast, you will never win tomorrow. And they left. You know what happened? Five o'clock next day, I found maybe uh, a dozen of young people from uh, under 16 and under 18 said, ah! said what, ha, ha, what do you mean? What do you want? 
we won, we won. So why you? Because in the dark, I could not be at fire their face. So you came and switched right on and you threatened us. And we took your threat, we woke up in the morning and we prayed, Fajr, and you won under 16 and under 18. I said, God bless you. This is something which you bring them to an arena called NEC. It's a motivation for themselves. So people used to come and we changed them from being just football player or volleyball player into volunteers, into some of them were working as, as well, still working in the organization and other things. This is one thing. Other thing, actually, if you remember that, when you take the community into places like uh, London, Royal Albert Hall, they never been to it. Only the affluent member among the community go there. But because when you hire the whole thing for them, and, and at that time, it makes difference. And from there, we were working on the community and on the family inside the community. So the family, you know, one of the most beautiful scene I saw at NEC, you know, as Asian, I, 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 they consider me one day as an Asian and give me an award on behalf of the Asian community. I, saw the, I told them that I was born in Egypt, but we can make Egypt a part, of, a part of Asia. And when I was there at that time, you can see the sister bringing the pot with plow and chicken <laughs> and samosa and putting it on the table because it could be a little bit expensive to buy it from there. And actually, I was very happy because the mother is there, the daughter is there, the husband is there, and the brothers are there watching the son playing, whatever they play. And this is, once the, once the family trusts you at that good old days, they bring everybody. And the best donation you wish to receive is the frontline donation from the unemployed, the pensioner, which is a half a penny, a penny, and five penny. I was going around, uh, me and my, my colleague as well, to collect all this. And the, the last, but not least, activity which led us to be very close to the community during Ramadan. This is for the people now. During the Ramadan, Brother Ahmad, we never sat at our home. We never say that we are going to complete Quran from chapter to chapter. We never said that we are going to actually listen to one Imam because his recitation is marvelous. We use to have something called caravan tour, small car from the first day of Ramadan or the night of Ramadan, first day, go from town to town, city to city, till we come back on the 28th of Ramadan, if we're new kid. Leaving your family. Leaving the comfort and being with the community. Not only in UK, but abroad. When we used to travel abroad, we used to come after Eid. So you find that your wife, and your children will celebrate Eid alone. This is the spirit of the charity which we want our young people to bring it back. We want you to teach them and mentor them, because our time is up, and your time is coming, Brother Ahmad, and the people with you in the office. Thank you for sharing that with us, Dr. Hani. Um, quite an emotional ending there, and I think I just want to say thank you for all the work you've done for over the years. Um, you have been, you've inspired many at Ramadan Temp Project, I know you've inspired many millions around the world and you've certainly inspired me again today and you know you've taught me that and just reminded me about you know about what this what, what we do and how it all becomes down to our intention and why we do things and also the fact that everything we do do is for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um so I just want to thank you um and I think it's, it's been great chatting to you today um I hope you are I hope you stay safe hope you stay well and I just want to say thank you to all of the viewers who have been watching today unfortunately time is up today but please do join us on our social media channels and once again i want to say a big thank you to you, dr hani it's been it's been i really appreciate this today thank you very much